What follows next is a little more interesting. I'm going to talk about a concept called years of potential life loss, sometimes written by the letters YPLL. Years of potential life loss is a way to look at how we can spend money in order to do the most good for the population. Years of potential life loss is really a discussion about what's the most appropriate use of the money to do the most good. Suppose we had a whole lot of extra money to spend in the national health budget. Well, one way we could spend that money was targeting the disease that kills the most people, heart disease. By trying to reduce people dying of heart disease, we would clearly do good because that's the thing that kills the most people in the United States. But there's a problem with that approach. The problem is the people that die of heart disease tend to be relatively older people. And, and yes, stopping older people from dying is a good thing, but the problem is, if we stop an elderly person from dying, they tend to die of something else fairly soon afterwards. So we're not literally buying much life for the dollars that we're spending. I mean, by contrast, if I could stop somebody from dying relatively young in life, age two or three, for example, well then, the odds of them living many, many years afterwards are fairly high. This is the ideation involved in years of potential life lost. The starting point is simple. The goal of medicine is not to help you live forever. Why? We can't do that. Although we sometimes wish we could promise that to our patients, we simply can't. The goal of medicine is to simply help people live a long, happy, predictable lifespan. How long is that? Well, currently we tend to use age 75. The job of medicine is to get people predictably to age 75. After that, you're in the bonus round. We're going to help you after that, but we've really done our job once you get to age 75. If you die prior to age 75, well, those are, here's the concept, years of potential life that have been lost. I mean, if you die at age 65, how many years of potential life have been lost? That's easy. 10 years of potential life, because 75 minus 65 is 10 years of potential life that have been lost. If 10 men die at age 65, how many years of potential life have been lost? That's easy. 10 times the 10, that gives us 100 years of potential life lost. Years of potential life loss is a way to look at the burden in the population, that is people dying, well, frankly, prematurity, life lost. The leading contributor to years of potential life loss in the United States is accidents, because the leading killer in the United States, age 1 to age 35, is accidents. So if you wanted to reduce years of potential life loss, the way to do that is not focus on eliminating heart disease or cancer. The way to do that is to focus on accident prevention. And if you've looked around in the United States, television, newspaper, radio, you've heard an awful lot about accident prevention over the last several years as we become increasingly aware of this concept. Number one killer of the United States is not accidents. That's a different question. Number one contributor to years of potential life lost is accidents. Number one killer, heart disease. Number one contributor to years of potential life lost is accidents. Let's turn now to a concept that's, again, fairly interesting, survival analysis. Survival analysis is really a discussion about what's the best way to talk about outcomes in medicine. There's a way that physicians often love to talk about outcome. We like to talk about the often five-year survival rate. Talk to anybody with cancer, oncologists do this all the time, we talk about what the five-year survival rate is. 25% is the five-year survival rate, 80% is the five-year survival rate. The trouble is that five-year survival rate, that's sort of an arbitrary marker. I mean, we use five because we have five fingers. If we had four fingers, what we use, the four-year survival rate? Why is that the best marker, the five-year survival rate? Isn't maybe another marker sometimes better? Well, the way we look at this is to look at empirical data. And we have some examples of empirical data given here in your syllabus. First, we're presenting you with two so-called survival curves. Survival curves are always plotted so we have potential survival time along the horizontal, in this case from 0 to 12 months. And then we have the actual percent survival on the vertical axis from 100 down to 0. What we have plotted for you here in this graph is survival after two separate possible procedures, procedure A and procedure B. Now you can see, again looking at the graph, 
that at the one year after each procedure, the survival for A and B is absolutely identical. It's roughly 25%. If I were to use the, quote, one-year survival rate, therefore, I would say to the patient, doesn't matter which procedure we use because the one-year survival rate is the same at 25%. But that would convey the wrong information to the patient because it would suggest that both of these treatments, A and B, are the same when they're certainly not. What we want to do is find a different way to talk about outcome. And so we're going to use the information presented not just a single point of time, one year, but the information encapsulated in these survival curves. The way we summarize these survival curves is to use a very simple metric, median survival time. Median survival time means by the specified time, half the people have already died, and afterwards the other half will die, half before and half afterwards. That's what median means. Please notice, once again, as always in epidemiology, we're not talking about individuals, we're talking about the group, the aggregate people that have all had this same procedure. The way we're going to get this, looking at your graph, is we go to the 50% mark, that's the median, we draw a line over until it hits the curve, and then we drop a perpendicular onto the time axis. You can see, therefore, that the median survival for procedure A is roughly three months. Using the same technique, you can see that median survival for treatment B is roughly eight months. Again, the horizontal to hit the curve, drop down the perpendicular, and there you can see eight months. So which is better, treatment A or treatment B? Well, the one-year survival rate might have them say they're the same. You can see that's clearly not the case. Clearly, treatment B is better. But wait, we can say more than that. We can say how much better is treatment B? On average, five months of additional survival. On average, five months of additional survival. Comparing not the curves using calculus or any higher level sophisticated way of thinking about it, using a simple, easy to use index, median survival time. Median survival time of treatment A, three months. Median survival term of treatment B, eight months. Therefore, B gives you five months of additional survival. Now, let's talk about how we might use this in interaction with patients. Let's say your patient has procedure B. And the patient says right after the procedure, Doc, how long am I personally likely to live? How long am I going to live after this procedure? What answer are you going to give your patient? Well, you could say, well, I don't know because everybody's different, but that's disingenuous. You have more information than that, and we ought to make use of the information we have as we're talking to our patient. You could say, my best estimate is eight months. But the problem with that is, well, our patients take us literally. When you tell a patient, I project your survival's eight months, patients think they're going to live till eight months and then boom, boom, die right afterwards. They think that we have some magical crystal ball, which we, of course, do not have. The right answer to this patient, therefore, the exam answer, is something like, well, my best estimate is between six and ten months. In other words, the key issue is give a range, not a single number, give a range. Because the range indicates some information, but it also, by a range instead of an individual number, indicates that we're not certain and we don't, in fact, have a crystal ball. What's the key exam answer? When estimating survival, give a range, not an individual number. Different question. An elderly woman, a grandmother, has procedure B. Right after procedure B, she says to the doctor, Doc, my granddaughter's graduating college 10 months from now. Will I be alive to see it? My granddaughter is graduating college 10 months from now. Will I be alive to see it? Looking at the data presented, what's the best answer to this particular grandmother? Well, you need to tell her two things. First, you need to say it's possible, because it is. You can see that it is a possibility. Certainly, a certain number of patients will make it that far. But then you also have to tell her it's not likely, because it's much less than a 50% proposition. When you look at the 10-month marker, you can see that only maybe 30% of patients that have this procedure are still alive. And so the best answer to this grandmother is, once again, it's possible, but it's not likely. Now, I know that's kind of harsh information. We'd like to tell the patients they're going to live forever, but when it's not true, we're going to tell them what the truth is. The answer, based on this data, is it's possible, but it's not likely. With those ideas in mind, before we leave this chart, I want to talk about one other issue. I talked about summarizing survival curves by, quote, median survival time. 
But I want you to understand that's a synonym for something else you sometimes hear. Median survival time is also said as life expectancy. When I use the phrase median survival time and I use the phrase life expectancy, I mean in fact the same thing. So what is life expectancy following procedure B here? Eight months. What's life expectancy following procedure A here? Three months. What is the increase in life expectancy as I go from procedure A to procedure B? Again, five months, just getting used to a different set of vocabulary. Please note what life expectancy means. It is not a prediction on how long someone's going to live. It is, as you can see from the way I'm using it, median survival time. Half the people die before and half the people die afterwards. With those definitions in mind, let's turn our attention to the second chart you see on the next page. This chart again gives you a set of survival curves, but now not survival after treatment, but survival after another important life event, frankly, survival after birth. Here we have a survival curve for people born in the year 1980, the curve on top, and a survival curve for people born in the year 1901, the curve on the bottom. Now, start off with a simple question. Looking at this data, if you had a choice, when would you rather be born, 1980 or 1901? Yeah, of course, 1980. You can see that you have much longer life expectancy in 1980. How do we get life expectancy? Remember, once again, it's median survival time. You go to the 50, you draw a line over. When it hits the 1901, you can see as you drop the perpendicular that life expectancy is 58 years. Now, it says that on the graph, but you can also see where we got that from the horizontal axis. We do the same thing, continuing across from the 50%. We now intersect the curve for 1980 you can see that life expectancy is 77 years. And once again, it's written for you in the graph, but you can also see where we got it on the horizontal axis. One simple exam question to ask you here would be give you these two curves and then simply ask you, what is the increase in life expectancy between 1901 and 1980? Well, as you can see, comparing those two numbers we just talked about, the increase is 19 years. There's a 19-year increase in life expectancy from 58, 1901, to 77, 1980. But now wait a minute. As I look at these graphs, something troubles me. I can see how we might have gotten the graph for 1901, just following people forward and plotting out when they died. But how do we get the graph for 1980? Here we have people plotted out their mortality till they're age 80. These people, come on, couldn't be, well, they certainly couldn't be more than in their 20s someplace. Yet here we have this plotted out until they're age 80. How do we get that? Well, simple. The same way we got the graph for 1901. Neither of these graphs are following people longitudinally forward in time. Neither of these graphs are predictions of the future. Both of these graphs are based on cross-sectional data. What we're using to compute these graphs is age-related mortality in the specified year. The way we're drawing the graph is to, in the given year, look at what percentage of the one-year-olds die, and then we drop our curve that much. What percent of the two-year-olds die? We drop our curve that much. What percent of the three-year-olds die? We drop our curve that much. What percent of the four-year-olds die? We drop our curve that much. The downward descending curve then is based on the proportion, that is the percentage of people at that age who die in the given year. In this case, either year 1980 or 1901. We're not, therefore, following people forward in time. We're using age-linked mortality patterns in the year, in this case, in the year of birth. Now, by that, if you're following me, you now know life expectancy is a much misunderstood concept, is it not? Many people take life expectancy to mean how long I'm going to live. No, it doesn't mean that. It means median survival time, half die before and half die afterwards. And secondly, Life expectancy is built on these curves, which are not projections of the future. They're summaries of age-related mortality in this specified birth year. Now ask yourself, is what's killing people and the percentage of each age range that dies this year likely to be what the same pattern is 50 years from now? Likely not, would be my guess. Then why do we create these curves and why do we use them to generate this concept of life expectancy? Well, quite simple. It makes it very easy to compare the general health between different populations. It makes it easy so you can tell me, as you did at the beginning, that you'd much rather be born in 1980 than 1901. In other words, it creates a nice, useful index. You have to understand it as an index, not as a prediction about actual life and death in the future. 
One other issue before we leave this chart I want to draw your attention to. You notice the graph for 1980 starts up at pretty close to 100%. You notice the graphic for 1901 starts down actually pretty close to 80%. We have quite a gap here in terms of where the two curves start on that vertical axis. What accounts for this gap? How come one starts up at 100% and the other one starts down close to 80%? What accounts for this gap? Well, the right answer is infant mortality. See, the first dot on the curve is not at birth. If that was true, everybody would, all the curves rather would start up at the very top. The first dot on the curve is the first year. That is, the fact that the 1901 curve starts down to 1980 is that's the proportion of babies that died in that first year of life. The fact that the 1980 curve starts up close to the top is that we had a lot fewer babies in 1980 die in that first year of life. What you see, therefore, in the change between 1980 and 1901 is a sharp reduction in infant mortality. Large differences in life expectancy are almost always due to large differences in infant mortality. Because remember, we're talking about starting, killing off people, metaphorically here, until we get to the 50% death. Once we get to 50% death, that's our, quote, life expectancy, median survival time. Well, clearly, anything that kills you really early in life has a disproportionate impact in lowering that life expectancy. That tells you that large differences in life expectancy are almost always linked to large differences in infant mortality. If I tell you, for example, that in the country of Russia, there's been a great decrease in life expectancy over the last 10 years, a true fact, you would also know, without me saying anything further, that in Russia has been a great increase in infant mortality over the same 10-year period. As infant mortality goes up, life expectancy, of course, goes down. In your mind's eye, take the curve for 1901 and start it right where the curve for 1980 starts. You can see there is still more of a slope, and so we would still have a lower life expectancy, but you can also see visually that the great difference in life expectancy between the two curves is not due to the slope, it's due to the intercept, where they start. Large differences in life expectancy are almost certainly due to large differences in infant mortality. And therefore, you now know on an exam question where they want you to intervene in the community to increase life expectancy, the right answer is not better health care for the elderly, better screening for people in middle age. The right answer is do something that decreases infant mortality. Think about better prenatal care or better neonatal nutrition as two obvious solutions there. So there's a lot embedded here. Let me go back as a quick review over the key concepts I want you to walk out with. First, how do we summarize survival curves? Easy, by simply using median survival time. Half the people die before, half the people die afterwards. What's another way to say median survival time? Life expectancy. How do we construct these kind of survival curves, life expectancy at birth as we're showing here, again, easy. We're using cross-sectional data, using age-related mortality in the specified year and drawing a declining curve based on those percentages. We are not, in short, following people going forward in time. In fact, the future may look very different than what we're finding by the cross-sectional data we're using for these curves. Finally, large differences in life expectancy, now that we understand the term, are really linked to large differences in infant mortality. The simplest way to increase life expectancy is to reduce infant mortality.